Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining Forensic Analytical Consulting Services today for our webinar on upcoming PCB regulation updates in the Bay Area. Today's webinar will be hosted by Forensic Analytical's very own David Brinkerhoff, who's the director of our San Francisco area office. David is a certified industrial hygienist, certified asbestos consultant, and a CDPH lead inspector and assessor. David has over 18 years of experience in the environmental health, industrial hygiene, and hazardous building materials consulting field, serving a wide array of clients with both litigated and non-litigated projects. David's contact information will be shared at the end of this webinar and will also be sent to you along with the recording of the webinar later this afternoon. Uh, and on that note, I'll pass the presentation over to David. Thank you, Taylor, and uh, thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, before we get started, just a few housekeeping items. Uh, this webinar will be made available on our YouTube page within about a day or so. Uh, in case you'd like to review it or share with some colleagues, you can go to youtube.com and do a search for Forensic Analytical Consulting Services. Um, as Taylor mentioned, if you'd like to contact me directly, you're welcome to. My contact information will be uh, presented at the end of the, on the last slide. Uh, you can learn more about PCBs and Forensic Analytical by visiting www.forensicanalytical.com, and you can follow us by searching for Forensic Analytical Consulting Services on LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter. Um, I'll try to break a few times during the presentation to answer questions. There will also be time uh, for questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, a little bit about oops, our platform here. There we go. So we're using GoToWebinar today. Everyone is in listen-only mode, so I cannot hear you. Um, which helps us with background noise, obviously, uh, but that doesn't mean you can't communicate with us. You should see a chat feature uh, on the right-hand side of your screen. If you uh, go to that little box there and uh, where it says to, there should be a drop-down menu and you can click, uh, click send questions to staff. And those will go to, go to Taylor and she'll help us uh, with questions as we, uh, as we proceed here. And with that, let's get started. Um, so by the end of this webinar, you should have an understanding of the environmental and health impacts of PCBs. You should understand the framework of our current regulations uh, around PCBs, as well as the forthcoming regulations uh, that are uh, coming out in July. Uh, and hopefully you'll be better prepared uh, for your next building demolition project. So what are PCBs? Uh, polychlorinated biphenyls. It's been quite a while since I've taken a chemistry class, but um, I look at that and I say, that's, uh, there's a, a number of chlorines on a biphenyl molecule. And that's basically what they are. Uh, PCBs are, are man-made chemicals. They generally have an oily or a waxy consistency. Um, they're formed by taking that biphenyl molecule and substituting the hydrogen atoms for, for chlorine atoms. Um, it's an aromatic hydrocarbon, it's found naturally, the biphenyl anyway, it's, it's found naturally in uh, petroleum products. Uh, PCBs generally have no taste or smell. Uh, there are different estimates out there, but it's thought that between one and one and a half million tons of PCBs were produced between about 1930 and about 1977, and about half of those PCBs were produced here in the U.S. Um, there was a study done in 20, uh, 2006 that estimated that 40% of those materials produced are still in use today. Uh, when we talk about PCBs and, uh, and chlorine substituting into the biphenyl molecule, there's a number of ways that that can happen. Um, to be precise, there are 209 ways in which chlorine can substitute into that molecule. Um, these are called congeners. 209 congeners, about 130 congeners were used commercially. Um, when we talk about PCB products, we're almost always talking about a mixture of congeners. Um, and um, it, it can, it, generally it's a pretty complex mixture. Um, PCB products um, that we're probably most familiar with are uh, a trade name called Aerochlor. Um, and we'll talk about that more in a minute. Um, another term you should probably know is homolog. Uh, a homolog is uh, a, a group of congeners that have the same number of chlorine atoms, but they may be present in, in different configurations. Um, so kind of recapping on terms, aerochlores are the trade names. 
that we, we often talk about for PCBs. Congeners are the, the individual um, compounds that can be, that we call PCBs and uh, homologs. You probably will forget that one, but it's the uh, uh, same number of chlorine atoms in different configurations. So talking about aerochlores, um, aerochlores were made by the Monsanto Chemical Company. And uh, we think production was from about 1935 to about 1977 for Monsanto. Um, most people refer to nine common aerochlores, um, and, and these aerochlores have a number after them. It's a four-digit number, um, and that number means something. So the, the first two numbers generally mean, uh, generally indicate the number of carbon atoms in the molecule, and the second two digits uh, represent the amount of chlorine uh, by percent in the molecule. So when we talk about Aerochlor 1254, that has 54 percent chlorine in it um, in some kind of mixture with all those different con congeners we talked about. Um, there's, there's one exception uh, that I'm aware of. You'll, you'll hear Aerochlor 1016. That doesn't mean it had only 10 carbon atoms. It was just they didn't follow the naming convention for that particular product. Um, PCBs were used in a variety of products, uh, mostly because they're very stable. They're thermi thermally conductive. Uh, they are very good at um, insulating electrical equipment. They have high flash points. Um, they're resistant to acids, bases, oxidation, hydrolysis. They're not impacted by temperature change. Um, most PCB products were used in electrical equipment or hydraulic systems, but a pretty significant amount uh, did go into building materials. And, you can see by this graph here, you know, maybe as much as 25% of PCBs manufactured did go into building materials. There are a number of different uses um, beyond electrical uses and hydraulic system uses. Um, you know, here's a list of some of the, the places in building materials we see PCBs, uh, different types of insulations. Most people are probably, probably familiar with caulks, um, but also mastics, adhesives. Uh, in some paints, in some roofing materials, in some flooring uh, materials, uh, and, and we'll go into this a little bit more as we as we go on here. But um, you know, really, PCBs were added to to quite a few different building materials. So when we start to talk about how to deal with these materials, how to survey these materials, uh, this becomes important. So why are we worried? Um, PCBs can get into the, the environment in a, a bunch of different ways. Uh, most commonly, we're talking about spills or leaks or hazardous waste that hasn't been handled correctly. Um, but although very stable, PCBs can degrade over time uh, just due to wear and tear uh, or if they're damaged or disturbed, such as in the context of uh, a demolition or a renovation. And PCBs are bad for you. Um, so, so why do we care about them in the environment? For, for many of the reasons that PCBs were very useful in industry and in different building products, um, that causes them to, to uh, create significant problems when they're released into the environment. They're stable, so they don't really break down. They don't really go away. They tend to cycle between air, water, soil, air, water, soil. Um, they can also bioaccumulate, meaning that organisms can absorb them faster than they can excrete them. So this is the little fish eats the plankton, the big fish eats the little fish, and then we eat the big fish. Um, the vast majority of PCB exposures for us, for humans, is through food, um, though we can be exposed in other ways. Um, we can breathe contaminated air, uh, ingesting contaminated dust. Uh, PCBs can penetrate through skin and also different types of gloves. So one thing uh, to consider when we're dealing with PCBs is are we using the right gloves? PCBs can go through certain types of gloves. Um, there is also considerable variability in the toxicity of PCBs depending on the mixture in your product or the, or the congeners in your product. Um, some congeners are as toxic as dioxins, which are some of the more toxic compounds uh, uh, out there. Uh, acute exposures can cause rashes, chloracne, which is just chemical caused acne, uh, skin lesions, eye lesions. Uh, other common symptoms of exposure 
can include fatigue, headache, cough, liver damage, immune system disruption, thyroid issues, and if your thyroid's impacted, that can infect, uh, impact all different parts of your body, including you know, the way you grow, the way you develop, your metabolism, uh, the way your body regulates body temperature and heart rate. Um, and also there's some evidence that uh, when children are exposed in the womb, it can lead to uh, 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 lowered cognitive ability. So for a whole bunch of reasons, uh, we don't want to expose people to PCBs unnecessarily. Um, PCBs are also probably a cancer, uh, cancerous. There's certainly evidence to, to support that there can be cancer issues related to PCBs. Um, the literature really talks about primarily breast cancer, cervical cancer, uterine cancer, liver cancer, and skin cancers. So as I mentioned, uh, PCBs can bioaccumulate. Um, and what's, what, what's challenging about them is that the types of PCBs, the congeners that tend to bioaccumulate in fish and animals, um, tend to be the worst players. Um, so the, the, the less toxic congeners uh, don't tend to bioaccumulate as readily. Um, so what that means for us is when people, when we ingest PCB contaminated foods or, or animal products, we're probably ingesting the, the most toxic PCB compounds, um, probably more toxic than what workers, for example, may be exposed to um, in the context of a demolition or renovation. Um, at this point, I'll take a quick break. I think we're doing okay time-wise, and if there are any questions, we can uh, try to address them now, or you can wait till the end of the uh, session. Yeah, and just, just as a reminder, you guys, um, entering your questions in that question box uh, to the right of the GoToWebinar platform, we'll be able to see those there uh, and read them out to the group so David can answer them. So there's none in there yet, but uh, as you have them, feel free to, to insert them there. Perfect, and we'll keep on, keep on going here. So, all right, let's get into the regulations section. Uh, there are several regulations that we should be considering when we're dealing with PCBs. Um, we're not gonna go into a lot of detail or really any detail today about Title 22, some of the California waste regulations or the OSHA regulations. Um, uh, what you really need to know is that, you know, California has its own waste disposal rules. We have to follow those, and there are requirements to protect workers from exposure to PCBs. Um, we're also, as we just started, start to discuss ta uh, TSCA, uh, we're not going to be talking about liquid PCBs, things in electro electrical equipment or hydraulic oils. Uh, we're going to focus the remainder of the webinar on how the TSCA regulations and the new VASMA program apply to demolition and renovation projects. Um, so, you know, as a reminder, this is this is a pretty introductory webinar. These are very complex sets of regulations, um, and the interpretation of those regulations um, has has evolved and, and is continuing to evolve over time. So. The 40 CFR 761, the Toxic Substances Control Act, um, TSCA. Uh, TSCA addresses the production, importation, use, disposal of specific chemicals. The, the, the original TSCA rule uh, regulated PCBs as well as asbestos, radon, lead-based paint. Um, under TSCA, EPA uh, has the authority to review chemicals, and if they find an unreasonable risk to human health or the environment, it can regulate that substance, uh, limit the use of that substance, or outright ban it. Um, this regulation originally went into effect in 1976, so this has been around for a very long time. Uh, some of you may have, have heard about a, a recent update in 2016, the, the Frank Lautenberg Chemical Safety of the 21st Century Act. Um, so. That's the most recent update uh, to TSCA, not really what we're going to be talking about today, but just so you know. Um, as it pertains to PCBs, the TSCA regulation is focused primarily on how you dispose of and how you manage liquid PCBs, mostly in electrical equipment. Um, what we saw around 2010 was that 
this rule started being applied more frequently uh, to building materials. And there started to be a more of a focus on PCBs and building materials, starting with caulk um, and then uh, kind of moving into other exterior building materials primarily. Um, Tosca identifies non-liquid materials, so things like building materials, containing greater than 50 parts per million PCBs as bulk product. And if you have that bulk product on your building, that is prohibited for use, meaning that if you sample the caulk on your building and it contains more than 50 parts per million PCBs, it's an illegal use. It's not allowed to be there. Um, I'm not really going to get into EPA fast, but if, if you want to dig more into this, um, recently uh, EPA came out with their facility approval streamli streamlining toolbox, EPA or PCB fast, which um, can help you develop uh, some of the plans that are required if you're going to be removing PCB materials. So, um, as I mentioned, PCBs were used in a variety of building materials, um, and the list of building materials is a little bit different depending on where you look. Uh, this list is from the EPA website. Um, everyone seems to you know, agree that uh, transformers, hydraulic oils, that kind of stuff, uh, fluorescent light ballast, ballasts um, commonly contain PCBs. Um, but I think over time, our understanding of what building materials may contain PCBs has evolved. Um, our focus started with caulk in, in interior building or exterior building materials, and, and over time, you know, we've added all these other things to the list. Um, and, and this is the EPA list, and I've put a couple examples uh, below there of other things that aren't on this list that, that we see PCBs um, in, things like backer rods and vapor barriers. Um, so really anything that, you know, sort of had a need to remain pliable over time, um, could potentially contain PCBs. So what the TOSCA regulation uh, really focuses on is on waste disposal uh, of PCB-containing materials, and it identifies a whole bunch of different potential categories of waste. Um, as an example, um, you know, here there's a, a caulk joint between some concrete and some brick. Um, if that caulk joint contained 50 parts uh, per million PCBs or greater, that would be a bulk product. And if I was to dispose of it, that would be a bulk product waste. Um, one of the things that is, I'll just say, interesting about this regulation or, or that uh, challenging about this regulation is if I identify that I have that bulk product waste, I, there's a requirement that I evaluate whether that waste has migrated into the adjacent substrates. So in this case, I have to, if I've got that bulk product waste in the caulk, I've got to now look at the brick and the concrete and the, and the mortar and, and try to figure out, did PCBs uh, migrate into those materials? Uh, there are a whole bunch of different numbers here. You can kind of look at this, but generally if we're uh, getting results below one part per million, that stuff goes out as construction de debris, we can uh, get into requirements for either, even lower levels, depending on what we want to do with the material. Um, if we want to recycle the material or if we're going to uh, redevelop a site uh, into residential housing, we, we need to get down into that unrestricted use level, uh, which is based either on the Water Quality Control Board numbers or the uh, original screening levels from EPA. And that's a very low number, 0.24 parts per million uh, for, for unrestricted use. Uh, we can also have combination wastes uh, in the context of a demolition. Um, PCB-containing materials can also contain asbestos or be coated with lead-based paints. Uh, oftentimes, there's solvents involved um, when we have to decon materials. But um, the real takeaway here is that when I identify these bulk product materials, I have a requirement to, to uh, evaluate substrates, porous and non-porous. And that can result in what we call remediation wastes. Um, under TOSCA, there's really no explicit requirement to collect samples. Um, again, this regulation is focused on waste. And so uh, the way it's stated is that the generator has the burden of proof to demonstrate that the material that's going into the landfill is, is going to the right place. 
But that determination can be made on, on a number of different things, including historical knowledge, building records. Um, it, you know, it doesn't say you have to collect a sample. Um, and we'll get more into that at the end of this section, but um, you know, the question comes, if you don't sample, can you really rely on, on those other things, on your historical knowledge or your records? Um, also, the TSCA rules don't make any distinction between demolition or renovation. They're just concerned about waste that's generated. Um, so one of the challenges we run into is if we do sample for PCBs on a renovation project, for example, and, and, and say my renovation project is to replace 10 out of my 100 windows uh, for some reason. And if I identify PCB containing caulk around those 10 windows, and it's the same caulk on the remaining 90, 90 windows, those 90 windows that weren't part of my project are now a prohibited use. I'm not allowed to have that caulk there, and so I've got to do something. I've either got to manage it in place, or I've got to remove it, or, or I've got to encapsulate it or do something. Um, so that can present some significant challenges if we're sampling for PCBs on a renovation job. So I talked about evaluation of substrates, and, and here's, uh, here's an example. Uh, in this, this drawing here at the top, you can see I've got uh, a window assembly attached to, to concrete. And that dark red is my, my bead of caulk around that window assembly. And so in this example, that caulk contains greater than 50 parts per million PCBs. That's my bulk product, which will become a bulk product waste uh, during the course of my demolition. So now I've got to evaluate the substrate, um, which in this case is concrete. So the way we often do that is by collecting samples starting you know, directly adjacent to that bulk product and then moving out. I may take a sample at a half inch out and then six inches out and then 12 inches out and then 18 inches out to try to determine how far the PCBs have migrated into that concrete. Um, and you know, we're sampling concrete. These are not easy samples to collect. And we've seen in some materials things like stuccos where you know, we see PCB migration 12 or 16 inches out from the original uh, bulk product caulk that's, that's installed there. Um, so what this requires us to do is, is multi-phase inspections. Um, you know, when I'm working with my clients, I can tell them, you know, you have, you know, 15 different types of material in your building that might contain PCBs. I can give you a cost to sample those. I don't know what we're going to get into when we have to start evaluating substrates. It's going to be dependent upon our first phase of inspection. So from a cost standpoint and, and a you know, consulting standpoint, I don't know how much this project is going to cost you, um, which is a challenging thing to communicate to our clients. Um, in addition, once we've identified these materials, we have to submit plans for cleanup. Um, these plans are detailed, they're complex. We have to summarize all of our sample results, um, including for substrates. Uh, we have to identify all the different waste categories we expect to, to generate, the ways we're gonna remove these materials, what waste sites we're gonna ship these materials to, and how we're gonna monitor this, these projects to, uh, to confirm we're not contaminating adjacent sites. Um, not gonna get into a lot of detail here, but there's two Two main approaches for these plans is what's called a, a self-implementing approach, which is basically a notification. You're saying, I'm going to follow the regulations and I'm going to notify uh, EPA. And that's a 30-day notification. They have 30 days to respond. If they don't respond, you can presume that they agree with your approach and you can proceed. The other way to do it, which is more common on, on complex project, is the risk-based approach. This is an approval by, by EPA where you submit a plan and, and they have to approve it before you can begin work. These approvals, uh, according to EPA, can take up to 180 days. So either way, uh, you've got a lot of time that's added to your project. Um, and this is just for the building materials. If you identify these, these bulk products on your building, you may also have to evaluate soils and storm drain sediments and sludges. Um, and these things require their own plans and additional costs. So again, you know, our challenge becomes how do we try to uh, communicate costs to our clients when we have no idea how, how deep the rabbit hole goes at the beginning of a project. 
and there's my example again of uh, of a caulk joint. Um, so talking about soils, I mentioned soils require uh, different sampling, different notification or, or approval. Um, if I identify PCBs in, in materials on my building, I now have to try to evaluate whether those PCBs have migrated into the soil. Um, and this can be a, a substantial effort. You know, we're taking samples on five or ten foot grids and, you know, all the way around the building. This can be a significant number of samples. Um, and then if we identify PCBs in building materials, uh, we've got to do some kind of verification that we've removed those soils and, and cleaned up to an appropriate level. Uh, depending on, on the site, uh, that level may be very low. Here again is that 0.24 for unrestricted land use. Um, in certain situations, uh, we may not be able to get to that level, and there may be deed restrictions placed uh, placed on the property if we can't hit those cleanup goals. Um, once we've identified the extent of contamination, again, this is a now a separate notification, self-implementing notification, another 30 days, or a separate risk-based uh, approval process up to 180 days. Um, and then we have to actually go and remove the soil and dispose of it. And then once that's complete, we have to sample uh, our excavations to, to verify that uh, we've cleaned up appropriately. And that sampling can include sidewalls, the bottom of the, of the excavations, you know, again, maybe on five-foot grids. Um, and these, these samples aren't cheap. You know, these samples are maybe 100 bucks a piece, you know, and we may be collecting hundreds of them. So... Um, very quickly, we get into um, you know a lot of delays, uh, a lot of time delays, a lot of additional cost that um, at this point many building owners just aren't um, expecting or ready for or have prepared for. Going back to building materials for a minute, um, here's an example of what a uh, an abatement project might look like. In this case, um, PCBs greater than 50 parts per million. Uh, were identified in caulk around the windows in this building. And we evaluated the substrate adjacent to that caulk, and we found that at about six to eight inches from the caulk joints, we had clean concrete, meaning we were, we were below that level for unrestricted use. So what that drives us to do is remove that first six inches of, conc of concrete all the way around the window frame. Um, this particular building, there was probably 300 windows, so... Uh, you can imagine the cost of chipping out six inches of caulk all the way around every one of these windows. Um, all of that caulk goes out as waste. It has to get shipped to a, an appropriate waste site. Um, so there's a, just a ton of time and cost associated. And then, you know, how do you do this? Um, how do you remove this concrete in a safe way? In a, you know, this, this is a you know, seven or ten story building. Um, and you can see on the picture on the right, uh, this particular contractor came up with a, a pretty ingenious method where they, they constructed this, this box out of metal and they would, um, you know, attach it to the side of the building and chip the concrete away from the inside of the building into the box, which they would then lower uh, from a crane to, to dispose of in bins appropriately. But, um, you know, this isn't your, your standard asbestos abatement project. There's, there's a lot of complexity to, to dealing with these materials. Oh yeah, and did I mention EPA is going to require you to monitor your project to determine or to, to, to document that you're not contaminating uh, sites on the other side of your fence line. Uh, generally, this is done with real-time dust monitoring. Um, a a risk-based level is uh, is calculated, and you're going to set up uh, monitors, you know, at various areas around your project, maybe upwind, downwind, maybe four points of the compass. Um, and you're going to do this monitoring during any time you're removing bulk product waste um, or or remediation waste. Um, if you exceed your number, you're going to have to notify EPA. And that notification, they expect it more or less immediately, generally within about 30 minutes. Um, so this is a big issue. And it's not uncommon to get exceedances because we're on a construction site. We have heavy equipment moving around. Um, other sources of dust that may not be related to PCBs. We may be downwind of a site that's generating dust um, that comes onto our site and causes us to exceed. Um, so there's there's all kinds of challenges related to the monitoring. Um, 
one of the things that's really valuable in this type of monitoring is uh, is our, our, our monitoring systems, IoT systems, um, that we can set up and attach to the cloud and, and look at in real time, set alarm levels, and, and get instant notifications to the team when there's an exceedance uh, so we can uh, correct anything that needs to be corrected, change our dust mitigation measures. And so I mentioned um, there's no explicit requirement to test under Tosca. So why would I test PCBs in my building? Uh, there's a number of reasons why we should test or why we may be required to test. Um, we have to characterize our waste. Um, we have to understand what we're potentially exposing our people to uh, during these projects. That's another reason to test. Um, we have to be careful though, uh, like I mentioned with renovation projects, if we test a material and that material exists somewhere else on the building and it's not part of our renovation project, we now have a prohibited use and that's gotta be dealt with. Um, so a lot of reasons why you have to test, um, but in summary, these Tosca regulations, um, they're applicable to, to all renovation projects, all demolition projects. They've been in place for a very long time, um, decades. Um, our interpretation of them, or EPA's interpretation of them, has, has shifted over time and continues to shift. Um, but with no requirement to sample, little enforcement, these rules are often ignored. Um, in the last five years or so, we've seen a whole bunch of uh, additional involvement from EPA Region 9 and, and more and more of our clients are, are putting in the significant time and money to, to comply with these regulations. And with that, uh, we'll see if we have any questions. Taylor? We've got one question um, that says, will you cover the types of gloves and PPE needed when performing PCB sampling? Um, not in this webinar. If, if you'd like to contact me offline, I'm happy to, to, to talk about that. Um, but we're really not going to get into the OSHA piece of this today. Um, just don't have the, the time to go into details. But, uh, but yeah, feel free to reach out to me afterwards and, and we can talk about it. Is that it? Great. And that's, that's all we've got for now. Perfect. Okay. On to the, uh, the final section here. What, uh, what everybody's here to learn about. BASMA, the Bay Area Stormwater Management Agencies Association. Um, this is a, an organization that represents all the different water agencies around the San Francisco Bay. And uh, here's a little graphic about where PCBs get into the Bay. Um, one of the things important to, to remember is that BASMA, their, their only real concern is protecting the Bay. They don't care about OSHA, they don't care about disposal, um, or I should say they're not focused on those things. Um, they're trying to keep PCBs out of the bay and, 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 and out of the food chain. So how did we get here? In 2015, the uh, Water Quality Control Board made a change to the discharge permit, to the permit that, that regulates the amount of PCBs that can enter the bay. Uh, they reduced that number. They did a number of studies and they, uh, to try to figure out where all these PCBs were coming from, and they identified stormwater. Uh, stormwater runoff is the largest source of PCBs entering the bay. And when they looked at the stormwater and, and how it became contaminated with PCBs, they identified demolition of buildings as a major source of contamination in this stormwater runoff. And there's a number of different ways that, that demolition projects can, uh, can impact the stormwater. Uh, track out of dust, just dust generating demolition activities, uh, changes to soil uh, causing erosion. Uh, BASMA was tasked to develop a program to reduce the amount of PCBs entering stormwater from demolition. What they created was a model program, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. Um, I think it's important to, to, to realize this is not a regulation. This is a program they created and they provided this program to each of the municipal municipalities um, required to, to follow this new discharge permit. Um, ultimately, each municipality has to establish their own program. And what BASMA has said is, 
here's a program. This, this meets the requirements. You can, um, you can take this program, put your name on it, and you will be in compliance. Um, but each of the municipalities um, is going to have to make a change in ordinance or a resolution or a managerial action or, or some kind of regulatory function to make this law in that municipality. Also, as part of this process, process uh, BASMA hired a number of consultants to figure out what building materials um, are most likely to contribute PCBs to stormwater. Uh, they went and did a lit literature review and they, and they, they created a matrix um, and they identified what they thought were um, the materials that were either most prevalent, um, most likely to degrade, uh, most likely to be disturbed during demolition. They had a number of factors, and they came up with this list of caulk, thermal insulation, uh, which could be foam insulation, that kind of stuff, uh, fiberglass insulation, adhesive mastics, uh, and rubber window gaskets. Those are what we refer to as the priority building materials. So who does this program and, and the resulting set of regulations impact. Um, as of July 1 of this year, anybody that demolishes a building constructed or remodeled between 1950 and 1980. Uh, so if, for newer buildings, you're exempt. Um, other exemptions include single family residential homes and wood frame structures, or, or the way they, they, they phrase it is stick frame structures. Um, this this definition, uh, so by demolition, they mean the complete wrecking, raising, and tear tearing down of a building. This is consistent with the Contractor State License Board definition of demolition. Um, this is not the asbestos definition of demolition, which just means to remove a load-bearing structure. This is your buildings coming down. And they also identify buildings uh, in a pretty, pretty specific way. They say it's a structure with roof and walls standing more or less permanently in one place. Uh, so, so mobile homes, I guess, would be exempt. Um, and they also state that buildings have to be intended for human habitation or occupancy. So, you know, the pump house out behind your pool isn't going to be uh, considered a building for the purposes of this program. Um, also, this program doesn't apply to the entire Bay Area. Uh, we're just looking at counties of Alameda, Contra Costa. You can read this, San Mateo, Santa Clara, as well as the city of uh, Fairfield to Sioux and Vallejo, and within those those areas, we're seeing um, that the jurisdictions that are passing the laws are, are oftentimes at the city level. So, city of Burlingame, for example, is 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 adopted this program uh, for demolitions in their jurisdiction. Um, you may ask, and I know I certainly did, why isn't San Francisco or some of these other counties uh, included? in this regulation. Um, I'm not 100% clear, honestly, on Marin, Sonoma, and Napa. I know San Francisco is not included because they have a combined sanitary and stormwater sewer system. Their, uh, their toilets and their stormwater all go to the same place, so it's all treated. So the idea is that any storm, anything that enters the bay from San Francisco has been treated and shouldn't have uh, high, high levels of PCBs in it. So what does this rule require? Here's the big game changer. Now you're required to conduct a survey um, of your building if you're going to do a demolition. When you go down to your, your building department and you ask for a permit to demolish your building, they're going to say, cool, can I see your asbestos survey? Can I see your PCB survey? Um, but they're only going to ask about these priority building materials. So this starts to set up a conflict. Um, BASMA and the, and the jurisdictions that are using this program say, okay, we want to see data for all the caulk, all the, the TSI, all the fiberglass information, uh, insulation, all of your adhesive mastics, all your rubber window gaskets. Um, but what about everything else? What about that other list we looked at of all the, the, the things that EPA considers suspect? Um, and BASMA does remind you in, in many different places uh, that these other rules exist. So on the right here, you may not be able to read this, but uh, you know they say many building materials contain PCBs. 
The building owner is responsible for identifying and handling all hazardous materials in accordance with all laws, um, including materials with uh, 50 parts per million or more PCBs. Um, so for the purposes of getting the de demolition, repit, demolition permit, your jurisdiction is going to require you to do the sampling for these five priority materials. Um, but now they've made you very aware that these other regulations exist that may require you to sample for other materials. And that's including things like substrates and soils. Um, I can't uh, emphasize enough that these surveys are not like asbestos surveys. These surveys are far more complex. Um, and for, for some of the reasons we already mentioned, um, you know, your typical asbestos sample may cost $20. Your typical PCB sample may cost $100. Um, there, you know, we talked a little bit about the impact to time with these notifications, all the EPA, EPA things, but, but again, you know, this, these requirements, now, now I'm going to survey, now what about the other phases of my surveys? Um, I've got to give you phase one survey for BASMA compliance, but EPA says now we have to evaluate substrates and soils and sediments. This is what, uh, the application package looks like um, for each one of these priority materials. Uh, they're going to want you to fill out the information uh, for all the materials you sampled, whether or not they're greater than 50 parts per million. Um, so there's one of these for caulks and there's one of these for mastics and all the other categories. And then they give you a category for other. Um, so again, they're pointing you to the fact that these other materials may exist that aren't the priority materials that the BASM is concerned about. Um, that section, though, is optional. And then you get to certify. So this is a pretty, uh, a pretty significant certification in my mind. You're certifying that the information uh, provided is true, uh, to the best of my knowledge. Okay, that's reasonable. Uh, you further certify that I understand my responsibility for knowing and complying with all relevant laws and regulations related to reporting, abating, handling, disposing of PCB materials and wastes. Uh, you understand that there are significant penalties for submitting false information, and you've got to retain this form for five years. And guess what? I've got to certify you as well. Uh, as a consultant, I also have to sign this certification form, which is which is quite a change. You know, I do an asbestos survey, and you know, I, I give it to you and kind of go about my day. Now, um, I have to certify that, you know, I've notified you of all these relevant laws. Um, so what, what it really kind of sets us up for is, you know, we have to follow the, Bas the BASA regulations. What about all these EPA regulations? And, and if, I, if a client makes a decision or a building owner makes a decision not to follow those, they're sort of setting themselves up for a, for a willful violation. They can no longer say, I didn't know about EPA regulations or TOSCA regulations. Um, okay, let's see how we're doing on time. I'm going to talk a little bit about what these surveys look like. Um, again, this is quite a bit different than an asbestos survey or a lead survey. Um, this program has a specific sampling protocol. They base this protocol on some of the asbestos and lead regs. Uh, it's in some ways similar to the AHERA sampling protocols. Um, but again, there's some complexities here as well. Um, one of the things we've seen is that uh, sampling things like caulk is difficult and uh, there are safety issues associated with it. We've had a couple people with some pretty good cuts from having blades that slipped while trying to remove caulk from a joint. Um, so choice of, of tool becomes important. Um, you know, the use of cut resistant gloves may become important, but if you use a cut resistant glove, you've got to somehow keep that glove from becoming contaminated. PCBs, unlike asbestos, will contaminate materials and you can cross contaminate uh, samples and equipment and, and yourself. Um, so if I use cut resistant gloves, do I have to put a glove over the top? Do I have to change that glove every time I collect a sample? Um, there's all these hygiene issues we have to deal with. Um, fall protection, that's not a new one. We're pretty used to that in the asbestos world. Um, but we may be, or we, we certainly do look at different choices of tools. Do I want to, if I use a razor blade, am I going to change out the razor blade after every sample? Do I want to go to some kind of a disposable tool so I don't have to uh, deal with the issue of contaminating uh, my tools? 
if I use a razor blade, at the end of the day, I'm going to have a bag of contaminated razor blades. What do I do with that? Um, here's kind of a summary of the, of the sampling protocol. Uh, us consultants, we have a new rule to learn. We're used to the 357 rule. We now have to learn the 13579 rule. Um, I won't go into this in a whole bunch of detail, but you know, there's a specific number of samples you have to take based on the quantity of material we're dealing with. Um, for insulations, it's one per homogeneous area. Um, they say here again that you know additional sampling. This, this comes out of the out of the Basel protocol that additional sampling is likely going to be required. So they remind us yet again that there's other materials we should be sampling for. Um, what they do ignore uh, are things like ballasts and transformer oils. Um, their their take on it is that these types of materials are managed typically during pre-demolition activities under other regulations. So we're going to pretend like those things don't exist. Here's another shot at the sampling rule, the 357 rule or the 13579 rule. Um, one of the things that's kind of interesting about this, um, so in this table I, I say caulks, but that does include sealants and rubber window gaskets. Um, the program identifies three different types of caulks to evaluate. It says look at window caulk, door frame caulk, and floor and expansion joint caulking. Um, but, you know, what about caulk around columns? What about uh, things like uh, penetrations or sidewalks or roofing materials? Um, so, you know, it gets a little challenging to figure out what we should be sampling for and what we shouldn't be sampling for. Another issue is that they require that the samples be spatially distributed. Um, so, if we're talking about window gaskets or caulks or window assemblies on a high rise, how do I collect samples that are spatially distributed? Do I need to, uh, you know, take samples from the first floor, the fifth floor, the tenth floor, um, the twentieth floor, and, and how do I do that on the outside of a building? Um, so there, there are a number of challenges here. The sampling protocol also requires a whole bunch of things that uh, many people aren't going to be used to. You know, again, this is not a, a simple asbestos survey. We're used to, uh, as asbestos consultants, I grab a piece of floor tile, I throw it in a baggie, and I drop it off at the lab. Now we're required to keep samples in glass jars with Teflon lids. Uh, we have to keep our samples cold. So, you know, I'm in the field carrying around boxes of glass jars that, you know, break easily, and I'm dragging around coolers and blue ice. Um, there are also very specific hold times that you have to meet. Um, BASMA says 14 days. Uh, your samples have to be extracted within 14 days, but that could, that could vary depending on the type of material that you're dealing with. 14 days is probably appropriate for, for a caulk or a window gasket, but, but soil it may not be appropriate. Um, you've also got to make sure you get the correct reporting limits. BASMA has a requirement of 50 micrograms per kilogram, 50 parts per billion. So, uh, you know, quite a bit lower uh, than the, the, the 50 parts per million number we've been talking about. Um, so it's important to work with your labs and make sure you get the right volume of sample to get those low detection limits. And we found that even when we think we get the right volume, sometimes uh, we don't get the detection limits that we've, uh, we're, we're anticipating. So work with your lab. Um, the BASM policy talks about using EPA method 8082, um, but they don't specify an extraction method. Uh, there are different ways to extract the PCBs from whatever matrix uh, it is you're using. Under TOSCA, uh, they say that there are two extraction methods that are, that are appropriate. You can use ultrasonic or SOXLET extraction. Um, but here in Region 9, anyway, EPA is... is made it pretty clear that their preference is SOXLIT extraction. But there may be other methods that are appropriate depending upon what your matrix is and, and, and what kind of detection limits you're looking for and turnaround times you're looking for. Um, we talked a little bit about contamination. So um, if I use a, a razor blade to collect a sample, I either have to dispose of that razor blade or I have to decontaminate it. And there's a process for decontaminating equipment. And it requires a three bucket wash with a specific detergent and time to air dry your equipment prior to use again. So imagine if after every sample I collected, 
I had to three bucket wash my my equipment and let it air dry. Um, these these surveys would take forever, um, and so you know a better option oftentimes may be factory sealed or, or disposable uh, uh, sample collection equipment. Um, all right, and then lastly, there are QAQC requirements um, for. PCB samples that are required by the BASM program, and these are things that uh, that consultants may not be familiar with. But you've got to document: Did you decon things correctly? Um, here's that that uh, spatial frequency, right? Did you document that you collect that you spread out your samples? And again, how do I do that if I'm talking about the face of a high-rise building or or, or other areas? Um, did you use the right kind of lab? Um, here's that. Um, Correct holding time and temperature. If you submit your your samples to the lab and they receive them uh, late or or too warm, you're going to get a note on your lab report that says you know samples received outside of the acceptable temperature range, which uh, you know could call could call your your data into question uh, if you had to defend it. Uh, and then correct methods and reporting limits. So. Again, this is not an asbestos survey. There's a lot of complexity here. There are some things that are similar, but there are quite a few issues that um, people doing these types of surveys are going to have to come up to speed on. And so now what? Um, I'm a consultant. As a consultant, when my clients call and, and, and ask about PCBs, you know, we've got to kind of start with who do you want to comply with? What kind of survey do you want? Are you trying to comply with BASMA? Are you trying to comply with TOSCA? Um, I can't tell you how much the survey is going to cost to comply with Tosca because I don't know how many um, substrates or sediments or soils that we're going to end up sampling or what kind of plan is going to have to be submitted to EPA or what kind of monitoring is going to be required. Uh, what materials should we sample? Do I just sample these five materials that the BASMA talks about or do I sample you know, the, the 15 or 20 materials that uh, are suspect to contain PCBs? What if you own multiple buildings? What if you're, uh, you know, pick a company, you're, you're a, a healthcare provider, and you own buildings in this BASMA ju jurisdiction, but you also own buildings in Sacramento, which is not subject to this rule. Do you treat your buildings different? Are we starting to establish a new standard of care for how to deal with these? And, and as a property owner, if you're treating your building in, in Santa Clara one way and your building in Sacramento, Another way, does that open you up for, for risk? Um, and then finally, you know, what we've seen is to really get these projects done successfully, you got to have the right team. Um, you got to have the right consultants. You got to have somebody that knows how to do these surveys, how to develop these plans, how to interface with EPA and, and now BASMA. You got to have a good lab um, and somebody that knows how to, 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 to navigate this issue around uh, limits of detection. Uh, your data is not very useful if, if you don't get a low enough detection limit. Um, and you need a good contractor to deal with these materials. Um, these projects have a lot of complexity beyond our typical asbestos or lead abatements. Guys that do asbestos and lead abatement, that's probably a great place to start. But we're dealing with specialized methods. We're uh, dealing with uh, complex waste requirements. So really having a contractor that's uh, experienced uh, with these types of things is, is going to help you get these done uh, effectively and, and, and successfully on a reasonable time and budget. Um, that's all I've got. Um, there is There are a lot of people talking about this issue right now. Uh, the Env Environmental Information Association is one. Uh, the NorCal chapter, which is a new, newly formed chapter of uh, EIA, is, put, is putting together a technical sem seminar. I believe it's going to be a half day or a full day seminar that's going to pull in a bunch of experts, um, also the Region 9 EPA coordinator. Uh, so if you're looking for more information about EPA, about PCBs, this may be a, uh, a good place to, to start. Uh, and that completes uh, my presentation with four minutes to spare. Taylor, do we have any questions? Uh, you did a great job, so there's actually only one question. It seems like you covered everything. Uh, the only question we've got so far is what are typical lab turnaround times? Gotcha. 
Um, either I did a good job or I just confused everybody. But typical lab turnaround yeah, time tend to be about seven to ten. <laughs> Tend to be seven to ten days, but we're finding um, it's not uncommon, especially when we're doing like some of the soil work where we're collecting hundreds of samples. Um, it's not uncommon unco for labs to get overwhelmed and not be able to meet those seven to ten day turnaround times. And so, um, yeah, we've we've seen quite a few cases where turnaround times get extended. Great. Well, that's that's all the questions we have now. Um, just as a reminder, everybody will will send out David's contact information, and there it is on the screen as well. So feel free to reach out to him if any additional questions come up. Uh, we'll also be publishing a, a blog on our website within the next week or two that cover all of these updates uh, very in depth, so you can reference that as well. Um, but that that concludes our webinar. David, do you have anything else to add? Thank you all very much for your time, and have a fantastic day. Great. Take care.